Once again, I'm going to start this documentary with a look at Chuck Penson's excellent book, Heathkit Test Equipment Products. Flipping to the Analog VOMs, Multimeters, and Voltmeters chapter. And as I pointed out in some recent videos, my book is falling apart because I've used it so much. Um, anyway, I've covered the majority of meters in this book already. And I'm trying to focus now on the the earlier Heathkit meters instead of the later ones. My most recent video was on the M1, the handy tester, which was apparently Heathkit's first multimeter coming out in 1949 parts of it being made by Simpson Electric in Chicago and then the MM1 which came out in 1953 so four years after the M1 and you might argue that this is Heathkit's first more full featured VOM while the handy tester did measure AC and DC volts DC milliamps and ohms the ranges were a lot more limited and um, while you could measure up to 5,000 volts with it, uh, the resistance and current ranges were a lot more limiting. The MM1, which cost $26.50, I believe that's uh, $19.53, I'm not sure. It says it was patterned loosely on the Simpson 260, although as near as I've been able to tell there are some issues with that timeline anyway it says it's sort of a big brother to the M1 it was built in a black Bakelite case with a leather carrying handle and featured a recessed 4.5 inch Simpson meter the unit proved to be one of Heath's more successful products and was in the catalog for 18 years DC voltmeter range had 1 1.5, 5, 50, 150, 500, and 1500 uh, switch positions, and you could also measure 5,000 volts using uh, separate jacks on the front panel. The same voltage range is applied to AC volts. The DC current range included 150 microamps, 15 milliamps. 150 milliamps and it could also measure 500 milliamps and 15 amps again using separate jacks for those last two the ohmmeter range could measure times one times well it says times 1000 here it's actually times 100 that's a typo and times 10,000 or 10k you could also measure decibels in the minus 10 to plus 65 dB range. The basic meter movement is 50 microamps. It uses 1% resistors. It requires a 1.5 volt C battery. It does not mention here that it also requires four double A cells. Okay, here's the artifact. We have one ohms scale and a 15 and a 50 DC scale which applies to volts and milliamps and likewise a 15 um, and a 50 red scale for AC. The 50 is marked above it in black and the 15 is in red below and then there's a special scale for the 1.5 volt AC only and that's because of the voltage drop on the rectifier used for AC volts that um, the voltage drop is significant when reading such low voltages so they really have to offset the scale substantially and then finally a red decibel scale
the meter movement is made by Simpson Electric Company of Chicago. So we have the usual common and plus terminals that are used for most AC and DC voltage readings, uh, milliamps, and also ohms. And then we have a special 5 volt or 5 kilovolt DC and 5 kilovolt AC plug that would be used along with the common for those ranges. And then there's a special 0.5 amp jack which is used in conjunction with the common terminal for that current range. And then if you're going to measure the 15 amp range, there are dedicated plus and minus terminals so you wouldn't use the common jack at that point. You'd move that wire up to here and measure between these two points. You have three controls. You've got the ohms adjust potentiometer which does not have a pointer on it and you have the four position uh, DC plus and minus so you can measure negative uh, or reversed connected DC voltages simply by moving the switch rather than having to swap the test leads and then an AC position and a decibel output um, mode. And then finally you have the range switch which is mostly range but also has some function selection to it. So um, for voltages you start out with 1.5 volts and then 5 volts, 50 volts, 150 volts, 500 volts and 1500 volts. For current we have 150, it says mega amps, but it means 150 milliamps, 15 milliamps, and 150 microamps. And then finally we have a resistance times 1, times 100, and times 10K, so 3 ohms ranges. One thing that's a little bit neat is how the control panel is tilted back ever so slightly. I don't know if that's to reduce glare on the bake light or if they just think those few degrees makes it easier to use or read. I'm not sure. I don't think I've seen that on any other multimeter. Interesting feature. The meter can be carried by a... I think this is possibly might have a metal core in it, but it's basically a um, hard rubber or vinyl or something carrying handle attached with a couple of screws on the sides. The rear of the uh, case is very simple. It has four uh, feet which are just protuberances on the bake light and I forgot to mention earlier, the entire case is molded Bakelite. And then there are four recessed uh, screws that hold the front and the rear case together. And with those screws removed, the guts just come right out. So here's the inside. The mounting screws for the rear are um, molded in brass threaded pieces so that's a mark of quality. This area here is the actual meter movement which is just sort of recessed into the case front and held in with these uh, small screws in four places. And that uh, meter movement again is made by Simpson. And then uh, we have the molded in terminals in several places. four of them along the bottoms and another one up here. We have the ohms adjust potentiometer and that selector switch for AC, DC plus and DC minus and decibels or decibel out whatever that means. I haven't read the manual yet. Uh, there is a shunt for the uh, 15 amp yeah, the 15 amp range, it looks like a piece of coat hanger wire. It goes right there, 
cuts across and goes down to this one. So that's a direct shunt and that's why for 15 amp measurements you have to go directly on those two terminals. No switch could handle that much current, at least not switches like this. And then finally we have the master range switch which is a pretty conventional switch. It's kind of wet there because I've sprayed it with deoxid and it hasn't all evaporated yet. There are three levels or three gangs or three wipers or three decks to it depending on which terminology you prefer. Just like there are two decks or wafers on the AC-DC switch. And then sort of unusually there is the dual ring phenolic structure that's used to support all of the range resistors. They're not mounted on the switches directly like they usually would be. Instead there are flying bus bars or just bare wires going from the switch out to these rings and then all these wire round resistors are soldered to that. It's kind of nice. I don't think I'd want to work down inside of there. You can hardly get at the switch without unsoldering everything. So that's a downside to that approach. Um, and then fairly minimal point-to-point -point wiring with all white solid wires. Here's a, a capacitor and um, I believe that's going to be used in one of the AC capacities, some sort of a DC blocking capacitor. And there are a couple of big wire round resistors here, which are no doubt associated with the 5 kilovolt AC and DC as primary dropping resistors before it gets into the normal um, attenuation resistors that are built on the switch. And then on this uh, metal bracket that helps hold the these rings there is a dual rectifier um, this appears to be identical to the one that's used on the Heathkit M1 handy tester which I have a video on it has the same exact look and it has the same red, yellow, and black wires coming off of it. And uh, let's see, there is this piece of phenolic material which is screwed onto the meter movements posts. Although there's no wiring on the phenolic, it's just these solder tabs that then are wired out. Then there is a battery clip for the single 1.5 volt C cell that's used for the um, ohms ranges for excitation except for the highest ohms range when that doesn't provide enough voltage and then there's this metal uh, bracket that's used as a battery holder to hold in four double A cells that provide six volts so that's what's used for the highest ohms range and since there was no polarity markings on here, I've um, once I figured it out, I've marked with a Sharpie pen, plus or minus, and then also sort of sloppily marked in battery orientation instructions. So that's really all there is to the inside of this meter. Because this meter did not come to me from eBay with a set of test leads, and because it uses the very old version of the banana um, jack. I just bought a set of Elenco TL4s from Amazon like I do with so many meters of this vintage. And they're just a very basic set of uh, probes with a basic banana plug. Okay for demonstration uh, see if I can mess around with this light and get a little better exposure with less glare. I have it in the DC plus position and on the 1.5 volt selection and the leads in the common and plus 
jacks and they're connected up to my bench power supply so I'm gonna turn it on and I'm going to move it up to one volt now remember we're on the 1.5 volt scale here so that would be 1.5 up here 1 volt would be here so it's reading about uh, 0.95 volts instead of 1 volt and I would say that's probably due to uh, some resistor or resistors that have drifted a little bit because there's no calibration on this meter it's all up to resistor tolerances and I thought the meter movement itself might be off but in some modes it seems to be pretty much spot on so I tend to suspect some of the resistors uh, I thought it might be the switch contacts being a little iffy but I've deoxed them and exercised them a lot and it didn't really help much so I'm, uh, I'm presuming it's just resistor tolerances gone after all these years now I could try uh, temporarily moving the switch and moving it back and that didn't help um, it's not a switch issue I'm pretty confident anyway so let's take it up to the 5 volt range so now this would be 5 volts and this would be 1 volt we're just a little bit shy of 1 volt gonna take it up to 2 volts and it's just a little shy of 2 3 4 5 so it's always hanging just a bit to the left of where it should be so now I'll go up to 50 volts and we're back on this scale here and uh, so a 5 represents 5 and it's closer now which also supports the uh, resistor tolerances thing I suspect that the tolerance or the tolerances which have drifted are on the low end of the resistor attenuator and are less significant as we go up in ranges so let's go to 10 you know it's it's pretty close 15 20 25 30 and it's still hanging to the left but it's basically working in DC volts okay up next I still have the test leads in the same positions I've gone to the 150 volt range and I've moved the switch to the AC position to engage the rectifier and I have my AC access panel connected to my variac and I'm just gonna go up to uh, somewhere in the area of 100 volts and we have to look at the uh, the red scale here this represents 150 this represents 100 so we're just about there and the very always reads a little low so I'm gonna goose it up just slightly and now we're doing pretty well over here uh, I would say it's reading more accurately in the AC um, function than it did in the DC function. And when we look at the schematic, we'll probably find that there's at least some resistors that are different for the AC and DC scales. So at least I'm verifying that that works. I'll bump it up to the 500 volt range. So this would be um, 500 volts here and it's reading 10 which would be a hundred so that seems to be pretty much right on where it should be okay up next um, milliamps and I'm gonna test it on um, DC milliamps I have it on the 15 milliamp range and the switch is back in DC plus and the test leads are connected uh, from my power supply set to 24 volts and wired through my 4 to 20 milliamp tester so I can get precise voltages in that range or currents in that range rather I'll turn the knob down to minimum which should give me 
pretty much right on four milliamps. Turn the power supply on. And uh, since we're in the 100 or 15 milliamp range, this is uh, 15 here. So it's reading just a little bit shy of four. So it is reading a bit low in the milliamp range. And uh, if I crank the knob up to about the middle, it should be 12 or really close to it, and it is. That's 12. So I'm going to switch up to the 150 milliamp range. And now um, 12, this is 20, so that would be 12 right where it is. And if I turn the knob all the way up, it should go right up to 20 or really close to it. Too bad there's not a mirrored scale on here. But um, it's really close to 20, so the milliamp range is working just fine. Okay, to test the resistance ranges, I'm leaving this in DC+. Plus. I'm taking this up to the uh, R times 1. And it should be reading zero. I have the leads connected to my Heathkit Decade Resistance box, and it's set to zero. So I'm going to put my screwdriver in the, if I can get it in there, the meter uh, zero adjust. There we go. So everything should be reading exactly what it looks like there. I'm going to switch in uh, one ohm, and it's pretty good. Go back to zero. Yeah. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Reading just a hair high, but not bad at all. I'm going to go up to. Um, 10 ohms. I'm going to zero this again, just to make sure it hasn't drifted. Okay, so about 10 ohms. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, um, 70, 80, 90, 100 ohms. Pretty close. Um, 200 ohms, just a little bit shy of 200, 500, so doing a pretty good job. And then I'll switch up to the times 100 range, make sure everything is still set to zero. I'm going to have to re-zero my meter because it switches in different resistors, shunts, and so on, so I need to use the adjust again here and um, there um, let's see so what am I going to do I'm in the times 100 now so two up there should be 200 so I'm going to bring up 200 it's doing pretty good let's go to 500 600 7 8 900 let's go to 1k 10 times uh, 100 is 1K. Uh, and then uh, 30 or 3K, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, etc. Let's go up to 10K on the a decade box. It's reading about 100 uh, times 100 would be our 10K. Let's go to the next range times the times 10k range. I have to re-zero the meter, make sure it's reading correctly, and it has shifted with the change a little bit. Um, need to re-zero it. Oops, not that one. This one. There we go. So 1k, 2k, 3k, 4k, 5k. Let's go to 100k. It's going to go to about 10 there, 500k, 
So that's all working just fine. The readings are not terribly accurate, but they're not horrible considering the vintage of the equipment and really the fairly low accuracy of these things in the first place. So there's the beauty shot. I wish I could get my camera to um, not wash out the meter face. It's getting so much reflection from the meter that um, when I aim it up there then everything else gets a little bit too dark. All right, let's take a look at the Heathkit manual for the MM1. I don't have an original manual. I have a reproduction made by manualman.com. Starts out with the resistor and capacitor color codes. This is the only picture of the meter in the manual. Specifications, as already mentioned, There's the uh, small form schematic there, which goes well because they put the circuit description up front in the manual before even doing the assembly. That appears to be consistent with other Heathkit manuals of this period. Instead of putting the theoretical stuff at the back, they put it right up front. So it helps to have the uh, schematic here. I don't know if it was that way in the original manual, but probably something was on that page. So there's the introduction, the circuit description, it gives some basic Ohm's Law, um, and then a simplified version of the DC volts function. And this is actually accurate, but it leaves out some of the additional switching. For example, the meter movement gets switched in and out of different circuits depending on which function you're in, and those switches are not shown. Um, also, the switch to reverse the polarity of the meter movement within the rest of the circuit isn't shown. So you have to assume you're in the DC plus position of the AC-DC switch and that you are um, measuring DC volts. So you start out with a big resistor attenuator and it adds up like this. It starts out with the 2K resistance of the meter movement itself, adds that to 20K, so you get 30K. That plus the 70K gets you 100K. Add that to this, and you get 1 meg, so you're up to 1 meg. Then you add 2 to get 3 megs. Add that to 7 to get 10 megs. Add that to 20 to get 30 megs. And you see how it goes. You add 30 megs to 70 megs, and you have 100 megs and that goes up in the same stair step from 1.5 to 5, then to 5 again, then to 150, then to a 5 base number 500, then back to a 1.5, or a 1.5 base number 1500, and then back to a 5 number, 5 kilovolts. So that's why it goes up in those um, steps where it's not always the same, um, the same order of magnitude, I should say. So let's just assume, um, for sake of theory, that we're in the 5 volt position here. And we apply 5 volts to the positive terminal between that and the minus terminal. So we end up with that 5 volts being impressed across a uh, 100K resistor comprised of the meter resistance and these two resistors. 5 volts divided by 100K gives you 50 microamps. Now it says 50 megaamps here, and elsewhere in this manual, the capital M means milla, so they doubly screwed up here, and they meant micro. They definitely had a problem with uh, their method of showing fractional units or metric units. I know that maybe it wasn't quite as much a standard then, but they're very inconsistent and it's very confusing, at least for um, 
people who don't have the uh, experience to figure it out. <laughs> anyway, so you get the, with the 5 volts impressed across it, you do get the requisite 50 microamps to get a full scale reading on the meter. And then it just keeps working its way up. And of course the, the last range, the 5K range, is not achieved by selecting the switch because it stops at 1500. You get that by moving the test lead from here to here so that you add this extra resistance. Okay, flipping it over, we have more circuit theory. And all it does is shows exactly the same diagram. It's trying to illustrate how the reverse polarity switch works. If you go from DC plus to DC minus, that everything stays the same, except now the plus side of the meter's over on the minus terminal, and the minus side of the meter faces the resistor attenuator. And then they go into what happens with the, the AC voltages. A little bit about the, um, the AC voltage circuit. So it has all the same ranges, but the resistor values are different. Um, and of course we have the rectifier added in here so that the meter only sees current flowing through it from plus to minus, so it doesn't try to read in the negative direction. The uh, bypass shunt resistor around the meter is also different, but um, one important note, and the same kind of rectifier was used in a, in a couple of the other recent uh, videos I've done on vintage multimeters, and uh, the most recent one was the Heathkit M1 Handy Tester, and it had exactly the same arrangement here. And I had just made some brief comment in there about, well, of course, when you have the negative half cycle of the AC voltage, you want to bypass the meter. And after I did that video, I thought, wait a minute, why do you actually need that? Because the meter doesn't care if you have current going in the reverse direction or not. It's going to work the same way, even if you only halfway rectify it. So why do they need this diode going in the other direction, actually? Um, and the answer to that is, uh, as I've come to realize, that these are so-called metallic rectifiers. That's all Heathkit calls them, and that term's a little vague, but uh, it's referring to one of the older uh, types of rectifier that is not nearly as good as the modern uh, rectifiers, for example, uh, silicon diodes and things like that. These uh, tended to bleed a little bit in the reverse direction, so yeah, you're going through this direction fine, but when you have the reverse polarity, this diode will allow a small amount of current to go the other direction through it, thereby trying to make the meter read a little bit in the negative direction. And that gets averaged in by the damping of the meter and causing an artificially low reading when it tries to read positive. So what they did is use this to bypass the meter so when you do have reverse polarity you're not taxing this diode. Um, you just simply bypass it through this half the rectifier and therefore this diode never has a reverse uh, potential applied to it therefore it can't leak and you don't have that issue. So that's the reason why these are set up the same way. And the rectifier on this is identical to the one on the M1 that I most recently covered. But even things like the EK1 meter had a similar arrangement. So it's a common arrangement probably for the same reason just because the rectifiers of the day were not very good. The other thing uh, about the AC ranges, and it's illustrated up here, is if the DC-AC switch is put in the DB output. Interestingly, the manual calls it the AF output position where the physical meter says DB output. Either case, it's referring to the use of the meter to read signals, for example, in an audio um, circuit. And instead of directly connecting the plus terminal to the top of the resistor attenuator, 
Here it's fed through a 0.1 microfarad capacitor which blocks any DC component. And this is useful if you're measuring say in an intermediate stage of a tube or even a transistor amplifier. Probably not a transistor amplifier at the time this came out. It would have been a tube amplifier and you would have had a number of interstitial parts of the circuit where you've got an AC signal riding on a DC offset and so this capacitor can be switched in when you're in the DB output position of the switch so that the DC part is blocked and all you're measuring is the AC part. But there's also a, a, a side effect to that that when you have it arranged this way the decibel scale of the meter can be viewed and you can use it like a view meter essentially. Um, so sort of as a volume level meter by reading the dB scale. The scale is calibrated in standard dBm with 0 dB equals 0 0.001 watt in 600 ohms establishing a zero reference level of 0.7746 volts and it'll cover, cover a range of minus 10 to plus 65 dB by using a conversion chart so I don't know I always thought those are of, of dubious value, but it's still something this can be used for. And then we get into the current part of the meter, and it shows the simplified version. And they, this is very common. This is done pretty much by everything these days, and has been for a long time when you're setting up a current shunt for a meter. Even digital meters do something similar. Here they call it the um, Ayrton shunt. Nobody bothers calling it that way anymore, but all it means is instead of putting a single shunt in and switching in different shunts, you have all the resistors of the shunt in series, and that's put across the meter movement, and then you short out various parts of the shunt with the switch for the, from the range switch, rather than interrupt the shunt in one place or another with the switch. Um, and that also has the advantage of not requiring um, as large of a switch contact and so on. Now of course on this meter the higher current ranges still bypass the switch and it's not in there at all. Instead different terminals are used for the test leads. And that's illustrated a little better here that uh, we take this basic concept with the plus and the minus these resistors of the shunt across the meter movement with its series resistor. And we go over here and expand on it. This is what's really there. Here's the plus still, and here's the, the minus, but there's also the minus 15 amp terminal, which is electrically the same, but it's positioned differently to be right next to this, this bus bar type shunt of 0 0.0167 ohms, and that goes to the plus 15 amp. So in that case you're just applying your high current right through here and none of this wiring or anything or any of this stuff even sees that current but you develop a voltage drop across it by virtue of that current going through it and then that voltage is impressed across the meter uh, the positive side of it goes through these resistors on its way there but these are insignificant compared to the resistance of the meter 2k and the 3K in series with it. So these piddly little fractional and very low ohm resistors might as well just be a piece of wire as far as the meter is concerned. So that works. And then the same thing is done if you're trying to measure 500 milliamps using that jack on the panel or as it's called 0.5 amps. Now you take this bigger shunt. It's a lower, a lower current trying to go through here. Um, but because it's a bigger resistor you still get a comparable voltage drop and once again that's applied across the meter so you get an appropriate reading and then once you get above that now you you start using this terminal instead of this terminal or this terminal for the positive lead and now the uh, current is fed into different points in the shunt and whatever is developed across that between there and the minus terminal that voltage is passed through the upper end of the shunt and back into the meter so that it gives an appropriate reading. 
there's a little bit of trickiness here. Um, when you get up to the 150 microamp range, it actually takes a different path to get to the meter than it would coming off the top of the rest of this shunt. And then there's an additional set of switches in the 15 milliamp or 150 milliamp range. The, the voltage from the voltage drop passes through this 3K resistor and to the meter this way. But if you're in, if you're in the 150 microamp range, now um, you're tapping off this point instead of this point, and it takes its own path through another 3K resistor and into the uh, plus side of the meter. All right, here's the uh, ohm circuit. You have to picture the resistor under test connected between the plus and minus terminals. We're calling that RX, even though my sloppy writing doesn't make it look much like an X. It's a little better. Uh, then you've got the battery in series. Uh, it's either just the 1.5 volt C cell, uh, if you're on the R times 1 or R times 100 ranges. If you're not, then this connection is broken and this battery's or this cell is put in series with the 6 volt battery comprised of four AA cells. So you end up with uh, 7.5 volts instead of 1.5 volts. And that goes through this switch, which is closed in the R times 10K mode. So either way, you have one voltage or another of battery in this position and it's trying to push current out through the resistor under test and let's just say we're in the R times 1 mode so this connections made here and the current continues back around here through this 11.5 volt resistor and then back to the battery so you have this simple little circuit here with a 1.5 volt battery or cell connected across an 11.5 volt or 11.5 ohm resistor and then some de uh, voltage is developed across that and of course if you assume that Rx the resistor under test is zero for the purposes of discussion then your battery is essentially across this 11.5 volt then if Rx is equal to zero ohms for the purposes of discussion and simple calculation, then you essentially have the 1.5 volt cell right across this 11.5 ohm resistor. Therefore, that resistor has the battery voltage across at 1.5 volts. Now you've got this meter hanging out here, and it's connected, the plus side is connected here, and it's basically going to be measuring the voltage drop across this resistor which is associated, proportional if you will, to the uh, voltage or the resistance out here at Rx. And the other side of the uh, meter is connected through these three series resistors to the other side of the resistor here. So you can picture this resistor, this resistor, and this resistor all in series. Uh, these two together come to 23k exactly. And then of course the meter is 2k and this is the ohms adjust trim pot. It's a 10k pot but normal practice is for something like this you just you try to calculate the rest of the circuit with the trim pot in its middle position or the middle of its adjustment, so think of it as a 5K resistor. So now we can go down to my little uh, post-it sketch here. You've got the 1.5 volt uh, cell, and it's wired across RX and the 11.5 ohm resistor. And for this discussion, again, we're considering RX to be zero. It's like a short, so the batteries or the cell is really across the 11.5 ohm resistor. And therefore, that, ha that resistor has to have 1.5 volts across it because that's the battery voltage and there's no other place to drop voltage. Then, we have to think of the meter circuit across that 11.5 ohm resistor 
It has the 23K resistor, which is comprised of all the other resistors in the circuit that are not being used to pass the, ma the major current through. And then you've got the 5K, which is the ohms adjust pot set to its middle, uh, middle most position of rotation. And then you have the 2K of the meter movement. And we know that to get a full scale reading of zero on the meter, you have to have the meter specified current going through it, which is 50 microamps. So we know all three of these resistors have 50 microamps going through them. And um, if we do the parallel resistor combination, all of these resistors here add up to 30K. So if we do the parallel resistor calculation with a 30K across an 11.5, uh, the current is uh, 130.5 milliamps, 130.5 milliamps, again assuming that Rx equals zero. Well, there is a very large proportion of that current, almost all of it going through this shunt because it's so much lower than the 30K over here, but still some small amount goes through here. And if we figure out the ratio of this resistor to this resistor, and then apply that ratio to the 130.5 milliamps, we find that all of the current except for a lowly 50 microamps is going this way, and only the 50 microamp part is going this way through the meter, thereby giving it the full scale. Now as we go to higher ranges, for example, the R times 100 range, this resistor gets bumped up because part of the resistance that's making this up gets moved over to here and taken away from this side. So this resistor gets bigger, this resistor gets a bit smaller, these two things stay the same, and again we would assume that this Rx is equal to zero and you'd recalculate the current recalculate the total resistance here compared to this resistance take that use that ratio to figure out how much current is going this way and how much is going this way and once again it'll be 50 microamps assuming you're giving it uh, the appropriate uh, resistance out here for a full scale reading it's it's really that simple the the math isn't really that complicated but you have to remember to take everything into account or it won't work out correctly. Okay, so I've just finished talking about the circuit theory. <laughs> Usually I do that at the very end of these videos, but because the Heathkit manual had it up front, I decided to do it up front while I'm going through the manual. Uh, so now we start the assembly instructions after, what is it? Um, half a page of theory starting about here, two pages, and about another half a page over here. So you end up with uh, about three pages of theory in the Heathkit manual. Then we immediately start with the instructions. Now if you're familiar with Heathkit manuals from later periods where they're just illustrations galore and excellent illustrations of that, and very detailed assembly instructions. You can't screw it up if you follow the simple instructions. These early manuals were a different story. It does have a little bit about unpacking the, the kit and making sure you inventory all the parts against the part list. parts list. Talks is about you have to make sure that you remove any wax or corrosion from leads and terminals before you try soldering. It talks about using the best rosin core solder, preferably a type containing the new activated fluxes such as the Kester Rosin 5 or the Arison Multicore, similar types, what we'd just call normal like 6040 rosin core solder these days. And then it talks about the, um, the wiring of the range switch, which is the most important and complicated part and cautions against uh, how it's going to be wired up separately and then finally installed in the meter housing and then the rest of the wiring done. 
and that's no doubt to simplify the illustrations and make handling it better. Once you get the switch assembled into the meter chassis, it's very difficult to get at the terminal, so that really does need to be up front. And then it talks about how to identify physically the different parts of the switches. For example, switch 1A or switch 1F. Those are the different decks or layers or wafers of the switch. And then added to the end of that is the terminal number. And there's a you know, bit of an illustration there showing how the terminal numbers go in, in order going around. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And it's the same on all of the decks. And then you have the different decks and they're denoted. Uh, for example, you know, S1A is the bottom of this deck. S1B is the top of this deck. S1C is the bottom of this one. S1D is the top. S1E is the bottom of this one. E, S1F is the top. Sometimes they share the same rotor, the part that actually turns with the knob. And that's pretty confusing when reading the schematic because it's hard to well, virtually impossible to depict that relationship with normal schematic symbols. So at some point you have to add text notes, which is what I did in my own version that I'm catting up right now as I'm doing this video. Uh, but the way Heathkit did it is pretty much just ignore that part and it makes the schematic really hard to figure out. Now they have a ring assembly, which is also a little bit novel. I have to think that's something they inherited from Simpson. And I've already addressed that when I did the, uh, the internal views of the meter, so I won't go over it again. But apparently that part was assembled, or shipped assembled, with the two rings and the metal framework connecting them and the uh, rectifier assembly already mounted on it. And here it identifies the various... Um, terminals that are on those rings. And then it talks about uh, now we're going to launch in with the wiring and it just does things like this. It does have a little description. For example, S1D4 refers to the number 4 terminal on the range switch middle deck. The middle deck is defined as, although well, the front deck is would be S1A or B, the middle deck is S1C or D, and then the third deck is S1E or F. So you know from this which switch you're talking about, which deck and which side of the deck, and then finally which terminal position on that side of that deck. So that's the code they're using and they describe it here. And then it just starts launching in. Connect a bare wire from B3 uh, to S1F7. Uh, and there's also meanings to that. B8 refers to the number 8 terminal on the B ring. So when it doesn't have things like S1 on it, it just has a number like B13. That's referring to the outer rings, not the switch contacts themselves. So you're connecting a wire from B13, a ring contact point, to switch one um, rearmost uh, side of the third wafer and then terminal 7. So it goes on and on like that. And there are some illustrations trying to show what it'll look like while you're doing it and some vertical looking down at it kind of views as you're building it up. I'm sure this was an absolute thrill to do. I'm glad I didn't have to do it. And it continues on and then it even has it kind of rolled out for you when you're connecting a lot of the resistors. And this is where all the resistors are put on the rings. The internal wiring between the switch and the rings has been done by now. And you end up with a real cluster looking thing like that and now you start putting the resistors on the outside pretty much just straight up and down that's the way it's arranged and it tells you to do everything that way so 
a very different way than Heathkit usually did it in later years. For really the majority of the time Heathkit produced manuals, they were much more elaborate than this. And then it talks about the function switch wiring. That's the smaller switch for DC plus, DC minus, AC, and DB output. And that one doesn't have a ring. It's just relatively few contacts, so it shows it pictorially here. And then there's a final photo of what it should look like and also um, a diagram here showing uh, the wires that are not part of the earlier assembly and how they connect up and, and to what. I don't think this is a very good diagram. I puzzled over this one and I thought, boy, good luck trying to follow this. It, I think it's really just there as peace of mind. You have to go by the numbers, not by the way it looks on the schematic. Still, this would be a lot more challenging for somebody to build. The, the later Heath kits were always anybody who can follow simple instructions could build something as complicated as a electric organ or a color TV or a oscilloscope or something. And it's not so with this. The instructions require a lot more savvy to follow. And I think they were assuming at least fairly seasoned electronic hobbyists and so on building these up. Otherwise they'd probably get lost with the fairly rudimentary um, descriptions of what to do. Finally there's some assembly of the board that goes on the back of the meter that holds the battery clips and so on. Talks about uh, the final wiring of that, um, how to test the basic completed instrument in ohms mode, in DC volts, AC volts, and the current ranges. There's no calibration on it. And then it talks about the actual use, applications, um, how to use the uh, meter to measure DC voltages, AC voltages, the so-called output DB or AF output or DB output, whatever um, functionality, that position on the switch, how to use it to read decibels, how to use the ohm meter, how to use the microammeter, milliammeter, ammeter, and then some special applications to read grid currents on most tubes, for example, or how to check auto radios in your car and so on, how to check FM alignments, uh, various other things you can do measuring DC voltage and ohm meter, and how to check condensers or capacitors as we call them now, various other things you can do by measuring AC voltages, how you can do some basic checks on capacitors. And then finally maintenance and all it does is says there's really nothing to maintain on it. And there's a little bit of a case of in case of difficulty section which is saying probably you screwed up with your wiring or bad soldering. Check everything. That's pretty much it. It doesn't say well if it's doing this then look at that. It's very general. And then it talks about replacement parts and if you want to send it back to Heath for service. Then there's the bill of material or parts list. And then some advertising for other kits they make. Two pages of that. And then finally the, the larger version of the schematic diagram. So I'm just going to go over the schematic here. I have not yet redrawn it. I'm going to um, just because I hate the way they've done things here. Hate it with a passion. It's not a very useful schematic to understand how it works. Um, so you've got the main plus and minus terminals down here, then the plus 5kV DC terminal and the 5kV AC terminal and then up here you've got um, the plus 15 amp and minus 15 amp terminals with that very low value shunt between them and then the 0.5 amp or 500 milliamp terminal and the associated with re resistors 
And uh, then you've got the main function switch. The two main uh, decks are here and here. This is the one that handles the resistors for the DC volts. That's all of these, plus this resistor over here. And then which battery gets used in the ohms mode is handled here. And here are the uh, resistor shunts for the, um, the milliamp current modes. The larger shunts are external. They're, they're these guys up here, so they're not handled by the switch. But the two that are handled by the switch are down here. Uh, then there's the other half of that switch. It's on a different deck. It has the resistors for the AC volts. And then it has all the resistors for the, the ohms mode down here. This deck up here, which I had to make all sorts of marks on trying to figure out what it did. Basically, it just shorts these two wires together for everything. Except, as my little note says, when you're in any of the ohms ranges, then this gap in the rotor falls across these. And it does not have these two wires shorted out. But for everything else... There's electrical continuity between these two wires. And this wire here goes to the minus side of the meter. And this wire here, via the polarity switch, makes its way normally to the minus terminal on the front of the meter. So for everything except ohms, and unless you're doing something like reversing polarity with the polarity switch, the minus side of the meter gets connected to the minus terminal. It takes a long roundabout route through a couple switches to get there, but that's what's happening most of the time. The battery is only engaged into the circuit, well, number one, by having it in one of the ohms ranges here, and also by having the same switch, just the different deck of it. Uh, I'm sorry, this is this is not that switch. This switch here is part of the um, polarity switch, or the function switch as they like to call it. Uh, these contacts here are shorted together only in the DC plus position. The ohms function only works when the the function switches in the DC plus position. It won't work in the DC minus position. And this contact here assures that. Then here is the uh, part of the function switch or the polarity switch, whatever you want to call it. I always think of it as the AC DC switch. Uh, this handles how the plus terminal of the the test lead plus terminal, how it goes. Does it go to the AC subcircuit? Does it go to the DC sub-circuit, or if it's in the AC circuit, does it go through that DC blocking capacitor? So that's what this guy does. Then there's another um, deck on that same switch. It's actually in two halves, two mirror images. Uh, one half of it handles how the plus side gets wired of the meter, and the other one handles how the minus side gets wired. So that's where the polarity reversal takes place of the meter. Uh, let's see what else. Um, then the, there are these two fun contacts up here. This had me going nuts at first. They're basically part of the same switch as these two. But, uh, for example, this contact here does about three different things. In some ranges, it connects the top of the resistor dividers for DC volts through to the rotor on this deck and then that in turn in certain positions namely the DC volt positions runs it back here and goes through the polarity switch and then to the um, the plus terminal here or the minus terminal depending how it's set up so that's what's happening there, but this same contact, this rotor up here, when you're in the uh, any of the ohms positions, shorts out these two terminals, so it brings the, the ohms circuit into this so it can access the outside world 
through the terminals once it goes through the polarity switch. It'll drive you nuts trying to keep track of it. And again, this guy does double duty in about half of the positions, namely all the volt positions. It just brings this wire and connects it up to this rotor so this rotor can do its job. Otherwise, it isolates this, and instead, because these two rotors are electrically connected together, which isn't really shown except by this nebulous dashed line and the thing saying rotors electrically connected without saying which rotors, um, it does have the ability to connect the wires coming up here, which ultimately come from the front panel terminals. It can bring those around and connect them to the 150 um, milliamp, five, 15 milliamp or 150 microamp parts of the circuit and those get back here so uh, oh yes and then of course the rectifier uh, is up here at the top of the AC resistor dividers and then the uh, the shunt resistor essentially gets wired directly across the meter when you're in the appropriate switch positions